Welcome to The Mushroom Show, the one place where you need to be if you want to stay on top of all the cool things happening in the world of mushrooms. I am your host, Tony Shields, and in this episode, we're going to be talking about why psilocybin even exists in the first place. Why is it that mushrooms are making this crazy compound? Are they trying to control us, or is it just a happy accident? Plus, we're going to be exploring the topic of functional mushrooms for dogs. Yes, dogs, I know that sounds a little crazy, but mushrooms for dogs is a thing, and we're going to be interviewing Dr. Rob Silver. He is a doctor of veterinary medicine, also a complete expert on this topic. Now, before we get started, if you like mushrooms, if you like the mushroom show, it would mean the world to me if you go ahead and hit that like button. It really helps spread the spores and get the show out to more people. Also, if you want to see future episodes of the show, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. It really does help the channel grow. Let's jump into the show. The first season of HBO's show, The Last of Us, is now over. And although it did introduce the world to one of my favorite mushrooms of all time, cordyceps, it also did so in a way that is not that realistic. As we talked about on the show before, there really is no concern about humans getting infected by mushrooms like we see on the show. But I did see a bunch of iterations of different articles sharing this story, which says, in a probable world first, plant fungus infects mushroom man from Kolkata. So the mushroom that apparently infected this guy is Crondosterium purpureum which is hard to pronounce, but you can see right there. And it's actually a pretty cool looking mushroom. According to Wikipedia, it is also known as the silver leaf fungus and it infects trees and it's eventually fatal to those trees. Why this is interesting is because apparently it's the first ever reported case of a plant fungus infecting a human. So in this case, it was a 61 year old man who was apparently otherwise totally healthy and actually was researching and working with this fungus. So he had lots of exposure and he had some symptoms that were mostly with his lungs and chest. And it turned out that this was due to an infection from this very same silver leaf fungus that he was working with. But he was given some antifungals he got better and that's kind of the end of the story. So why do we keep seeing articles like this? Well, I think it's because even though it is unrealistic or even though it is very unlikely that mushrooms are gonna infect humans on a mass scale, like we see in The Last of Us, it is this idea that if mushrooms were adapting or if mushrooms adapted the ability to infect humans, that would be a big deal. And it would be pretty concerning if you know mushrooms that typically infect and kill trees start doing this to humans. But again, something like this is very unlikely. They're very isolated cases and very rare. I think we're probably gonna start seeing less stories like this at least until The Last of Us season two comes out. On to our next story. Now I saw this article pop up on my feed and it says mountain rescuers called to save hikers on magic mushrooms. And it's basically about a group of hikers that went out for a hike uh, on mushrooms and they must have got lost or disoriented or whatever and they ended up needing to be rescued and to be fair This isn't really much of a story. It's just some hikers that got lost and got rescued But it is a good opportunity for a PSA now a lot of people like to trip or experience mushrooms in nature because well mushrooms kind of induce this sense of awe and being out in nature really helps to amplify that and really help to bring that out because for a lot of people, nature also induces a sense of awe. But combining something like a serious hiking adventure and psilocybin containing mushrooms is probably not a great idea. But here's why I wanted to share this story and why I think it really matters. It's because the media like this is never going to report on the situations where people went out into the woods and did mushrooms and had a great time and went home because, well, that's just not a great story. They're only gonna report on the situations where people get lost and need to be rescued or fall into a waterfall like this story here in the National Post where a woman was believed to be under the influence of magic mushrooms when she drowned, which is obviously tragic, but also this kind of thing could really have an outsized impact on the potential regulation and legislation of mushrooms. Again, this story talks about a person who drowned apparently while under the influence of psilocybin, but then conflates it with things like psilocybin therapy and legalization, etc., which in my opinion doesn't make a lot of sense. And it would definitely be a shame if this kind of thing influenced the public perception of mushrooms in general. So I think it makes sense to keep all of this in mind when you're looking at stories like this in the news. On to our next segment. So I saw this meme on Twitter 
and it basically shows a dude here who's looking at a nice uh, pile of Psilocybe cubensis mushrooms, it looks like. And he says, you have shown me the way with your mystical powers. And the mushrooms respond by saying, my defense mechanism is literally to make you hallucinate so you don't eat me. And I shared this on Twitter and it really kicked off a whole conversation as to why mushrooms produce psilocybin in the first place. And I asked the question, like, could it really be that simple? Are mushrooms simply producing psilocybin as a defense mechanism so people don't eat them so that they can propagate? Or is it something altogether different? Like mushrooms produce all sorts of crazy chemicals and maybe some mushrooms just happen to produce uh, one chemical that seems to mimic serotonin and can plug into our receptors and just by happenstance has the opportunity to really alter our consciousness. I thought it would be fun to explore some of these ideas, go over some of the main ones, and then go over the explanation that I think is the most likely. Okay, so number one, mushrooms produce psilocybin as a communication mechanism. And this idea is definitely the furthest out there, but it's also one of my favorite to think about just because it's fun to think of all the potential implications. And it's this idea that mushrooms actually produce psilocybin as a way to communicate with humans. Again, this idea does seem like a bit of a stretch, but people who have experienced high doses of psilocybin, some will say that mushrooms do have a distinct character or kind of a presence, if you will, or an entity. The idea is that mushrooms as a being have a consciousness and psilocybin is kind of like this ancient alien technology that is used to communicate with us humans. And this idea is further propagated by the fact that mushrooms literally could be from another planet. The spores can survive in space and they could theoretically travel through space. So they could even be literal extraterrestrials. If you really wanted to have fun thinking about it, you could imagine that spores are some ancient alien technology that we were blast out into the universe in some desperate attempt to communicate with other beings. Of course, I didn't come up with this idea. Lots of people have had fun thinking about it. For example, Terence McKenna, who has talked about aliens being extraterrestrials. Here's what he had to say on the topic. What is a mushroom? First of all, they reproduce by spores. They can survive the uh, radiation levels of interstellar space. The mushroom spore falls into an ecosystem, a fine thread-like network full of neurotransmitters begins to spread itself through the soil. I mean, the visual hallucination, somehow I can work it around that these are floods of imagery set off from deep structures of the brain, but that it can just address you in real time and say, Terence, it actually is an extraterrestrial. In kind of the same vein, somebody replied to my tweet and said, could it be that psilocybin is simply a planetary immune response? The earth as an intelligent being that utilizes fungi as an ecosystem modulating organ. The psilocybin are released by the earth as an agent to modify our behavior for the betterment of the planetary organism, which is another kind of interesting yet far out there idea. None of them all that likely in my opinion, but it's still pretty fun to think about. Okay, so number two is this idea that mushrooms produce psilocybin because it's either undesirable or desirable to humans. And this is kind of what this meme was talking about with this guy chatting with the mushrooms here is that the mushrooms are producing the psilocybin as a defense mechanism. And this seems pretty reasonable at first glance because sure, you know, the mushrooms don't want to be eaten. So they produce this poison to prevent humans, or I guess our ancestors, uh, or whatever that version is of humans from eating these mushrooms. And that allows them to grow and to propagate. The problem with this theory, however, is that, well, psilocybin is not poisonous. So if that's what the mushrooms were trying to do, well, they failed horribly. And in fact, not only do we seek out these mushrooms, we actually now cultivate them at a mass scale. So you could say the opposite then, that the mushrooms somehow figured out that psilocybin would be desirable and they produce it so that humans help to propagate the species. And of course, 
People do grow these types of mushrooms. They even go so far as, you know, filling super soakers full of spore slurries and blasting them all over the forest to help propagate the species. Fully though, this theory doesn't really make a lot of sense either because psilocybin containing mushrooms likely evolved before humans, not alongside humans. So they probably developed the ability to produce psilocybin long before humans were eating them. So humans finding it desirable or undesirable is probably not the reason why mushrooms produce psilocybin. Number three, and this is what I think probably to be the most likely, is this idea that mushrooms produce psilocybin as a defense mechanism against bugs. And the fact is a lot of psilocybin containing mushrooms grow on poop where there's obviously a lot of flies and a lot of bugs that might be buzzing around and might want to nibble on these mushrooms before they get a chance to release their spores. And here's the key insight is that of course, psilocybin has a profound effect on the human mind, but for the mind of bugs and insects, it has a different effect, one in which it can suppress their appetite. And it would make perfect sense to produce a compound like that if you want certain insects to stop eating you. Of course, researchers have looked into it, and this is the central idea behind this paper, which again, I think is the most likely reason why certain mushrooms evolved to produce psilocybin. The paper is titled Horizontal Gene Cluster Transfer Increased Hallucinogenic Mushroom Diversity, and it was published in Evolution Letters in 2018. Now in this study, researchers found that a gene cluster responsible for producing psilocybin was present in various distantly related psilocybin mushroom species, but not in their closely related non-psychoactive counterparts. They discovered that this gene cluster had likely been transferred between different species of fungi through a process called horizontal gene transfer. This idea of horizontal gene transfer kind of short-circuited the evolution and allowed a bunch of species to all of a sudden be able to produce psilocybin. And again, this is supported by the idea that a lot of these psilocybin containing mushrooms grow on dung, they grow on cow poop, they also grow on, you know, like wood chips and wood decay or other areas where there might be a lot of bugs. So it makes a lot of sense in that context as well. And also, I mean, it's not just psilocybin, right? Other plants do this type of thing. You can think of like spicy foods. So say ghost pepper, for example, an elephant is not going to touch it because it's way too spicy, yet a bird can come and eat the seeds and the birds are totally unaffected. So this ghost pepper is producing a certain compound that deters one species, but might even attract another. You may have also heard of Amanita muscaria being called fly agaric because it has been used historically because of its ibotenic acid concentration as a way to kill flies. Now, I'm not 100% sure if this is true, but I have heard that the concentration of ibotenic acid is pretty high when the veil is still closed, but it goes down dramatically after the veil is opened. And if you think about that, it kind of makes sense because when the veil is closed, you wouldn't want bugs eating the mushroom because it hasn't yet produced its spores. But once the veil is open and it's ready to release its spores, well, it might even want to invite the bugs in because it might help spread the spores far and wide. But again, this is just another example of mushrooms producing a certain compound that yes, has the effect of protecting itself from bugs or from other environmental factors yet it just happens to have a profound impact on the human mind. Now, this whole idea definitely kicked off a lot of discussion on Twitter. There's tons of comments, people sharing their ideas and different articles as to why they think mushrooms produce this compound. And I'm hoping the same happens on here. So if you're watching this on YouTube, let me know in the comments below, why do you think mushrooms produce psilocybin? Do you think it's as simple as this or do you think there's some more complex explanation? Okay, one for you too. Oh okay. yeah, get over there. That's it, done. Okay, now I'm all slobbery. On to our next story. Now, back in 2019, something interesting happened. We were noticing that at Fresh Cap, a lot of people were buying mushroom supplements, not only for themselves, but also for their dogs which seemed like a really weird concept to me. I mean, obviously functional mushrooms have a lot of benefits for humans, but the idea that they could have benefits for dogs just was a completely new idea. The only time I've ever heard about mushrooms and dogs is when you know somebody would join in on one of the Facebook groups 
worried that their dog had just eaten a mushroom from their backyard and they were worried that it might be poisonous. I've even had this experience myself with Otis who would come with me foraging all the time. And you know, sometimes he'll just like pick a mushroom off a log and eat it. And uh, most of the time he's got a pretty iron gut, so it's not a big deal. But the idea again of functional mushrooms for dogs or medicinal mushrooms being used for dog benefits just seemed like a really weird concept. But the more I started looking into this, the more I realized that yes, functional mushrooms could have a lot of potential benefits for dogs. And that explains why so many people were doing this specifically with turkey tail. And basically how people would do it is they would get like mushroom extract powder and they would just kind of sprinkle it over their dog's kibble and hopefully the dog would like it. Of course, one of the main differences between supplementing dogs and humans is that humans will eat something just because they know it's good for them, even if it doesn't taste great. Whereas dogs, they're not really the same. You know, if it doesn't taste good, they're gonna let you know by just not eating it, which is why we ended up developing shroomies, which is just like this little, you know, it's a little chew, a little mushroom shaped chew that has all the mushrooms in there and that's actually palatable and tasty for the dogs. Took a lot of iterations to get right. Nova is one of our dogs who's super picky and we kind of used her as a taste tester. Went through probably 12 or 15 variations before we finally figured out something that can properly mask that kind of bitter earthy flavor for dogs. But the bottom line here is that functional mushrooms, yes, can have a lot of benefits for dogs. Now to dive into this a little deeper, we sat down with Dr. Rob Silver. He is a noted holistic integrative veterinarian with over 30 years experience in clinical small animal practice using supplements for pets. He was the chief medical officer for RX Vitamins for pets. He's formulated dozens of products and now is applying all of that knowledge, formulating mushroom products for real mushrooms and their pet line. We talked about why dogs would be using functional mushrooms in the first place and what types of mushrooms might be most beneficial based on his experience. We also talked about some of the ways that you can get mushrooms into a dog's diet dosage and safety profiles, and also how to tell if a dog is actually getting any benefits. Now, there are a lot of people that understand functional mushrooms and a lot of people that understand veterinary medicine, but Rob is one of the few people that is a complete expert in both, which is why I was so excited to get him on the show. Let's jump into the conversation. So Dr. Rob Silver, thank you so much for joining us today on The Mushroom Show. Well, Tony, it's great to be here. I'm such a fan of yours. To actually be here with you is really incredible. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I really appreciate that. Now, so the first question I have, and I need to ask you this, maybe get it out of the way, because I think a lot of people, when they hear about this topic, mushrooms for dogs, they'll say, hey, wait a minute, you know, I thought mushrooms are poisonous. So let me ask you right off the top, are mushrooms safe for dogs? The answer to that, the short answer is, if a mushroom is safe for a human, it's safe for a dog. Um, but a lot of veterinarians, um, their first experience with a dog having eaten some mushrooms is the dog that's in the backyard eating some mushrooms that are just coming up after a rain and oftentimes those are very poisonous. And so that's where most veterinarians have a negative attitude about mushrooms. But no, if a human can eat it, a dog can eat it. Yeah, that's a great point because you're right. You know, when I first started hearing about mushrooms for dogs, the only thing you would hear would be in like random Facebook groups where people were worried about their dog who had eaten a mushroom in the backyard and they're worried that it might get sick. And people aren't often thinking about functional mushrooms for dogs or medicinal mushrooms for dogs. So on that point, exactly. like what are some of the specific mushrooms that you, you know, as a doctor of veterinary medicine, find to be beneficial of dogs? And what are some of the reasons why people are giving these mushrooms to their dogs in the first place? Well, actually, I believe that each mushroom has its own particular value for a dog, and the values for dogs are very similar to the values that we see with people. But I have kind of highlighted a couple of key conditions or key uses or applications for specific mushrooms you know so uh, personally my favorite mushroom was reishi just because it has it, i call it like the swiss army knife it has just so many different ingredients in it that have so many different values from having anti-cholesterol properties to antihistamine properties to anti-cancer properties to anti-inflammation properties and to that whole calming aspect that we see with reishi you know it was used by zen masters as a meditation aid for for years so those are the same applications for dogs oftentimes with dogs i'm looking right now at 
use as the reishi for its antihistaminic properties with seasonal allergies because we're in that season right now. And the benefit of the triterpenes that have antihistaminic property combined with the beta-glucans from reishi, the beta-glucans help to harmonize them. I mean, with allergies, immune systems get a little bit out of whack, getting a little too excited about things it shouldn't get excited about. So that's where I think mushrooms can also help to get the immune system to fly right, you know, as well. So reishi would be one example, you know, next is turkey tail. And I think mushrooms for pets really got their, their, their oomph from in 2012, when there was a study published using an extract of the turkey tail mushroom in dogs that have a really nasty cancer of the spleen called hemangiosarcoma that is always fatal and often very quickly fatal. Maybe not always, always is a big word, but most commonly fatal and very quickly so. And they found that the dogs that were on this higher dose of this extract from turkey tail had better survival times than dogs that were on chemotherapy. So that got everybody's attention and a lot of pet parents rushing to use turkey tail because pet cancer is on the rise. They say that probably 50% of all of our critters are going to die from cancer or cancer-related things. Next mushroom I would talk about is not really a mushroom. Chaga. Chaga is mycelium growing into the bark, the bark of the birch tree. And chaga, like reishi, has terpenes, triterpenes in it that have um, you know, ample antihistaminic properties. And so um, I think chaga has a good application there. Plus, chaga has been known historically for its benefit to the gastrointestinal system. And and I like the chaga extract because it's kind of it's kind of woody. It's kind of barky and 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 bland tasting. And I think that it provides a benefit when it's taken in that regards to the microbiome in the bowel. So, and then of course, chaga has historically been used for cancer. Uh, we don't have any studies of it in dogs, but certainly that would be one mushroom that I would recommend if, um, if a pet parent was asking me about something for their dog for cancer. Lion's mane. I think lion's mane is huge. Lion's mane is currently the most popular mushroom in America because of its benefit for stress and memory and mild dementia. And it's no different with our dogs. Um, our older dogs get a mild form of dementia called canine cognitive disorder where they can't find the dog door. Maybe they don't know where their food bowl is. Same as for people that have an Alzheimer's-like condition or something along those lines. And we're finding in these dogs that with the use of the lion's mane mushroom at moderate dosages, that many of them are, re are returning to normal, so to speak. They can be able to find the dog door and fi find their bowl. And there's so many stressors in our pets' lives as there are in our own. And I see lion's mane as being very valuable in that sense. But we also know lion's mane to be good for digestion. So I'll also recommend lion's mane with a note with, uh, with digestive problems like inflammatory bowel disease. I'll also recommend lion's mane if we're having some kind of digestive system cancer. Yeah, that's Did amazing. I <laughs> no, I mean, there's there's so many so many angles uh, we could dive into here, and I guess like the headline, which I huh. think might be surprising to a lot of people, is that many the same way that humans benefit from mushrooms, our pets can also yeah. benefit from these mushrooms, which I think is really interesting. And I've, you know, that's what kicked it off for me as well. I noticed kind of in the earlier days of Fresh Cap, a lot of people were buying turkey tail specifically for their dogs, and they're just kind of sprinkling it on their kibble. And I thought, what is really going on here? So you know, I did read into the study you mentioned, which is really interesting and i think you know there's going to be a lot more of these studies over time that starts to reveal some of these benefits yes. but i guess the first direction i want to go is is you know for you talked about these mushrooms like reishi and uh, chaga and turkey tail you know these are mushrooms that we can't just eat they're kind of woody they're kind of tough i guess a dog probably wouldn't mind chewing on a reishi conch or on a chaga but you know what is the well, best way to actually give these mushrooms to dogs other than just letting them chew on a chunk of chaga because the other thing you mentioned was a number of these compounds like triterpenes and beta glucans um and we want to make sure that they're actually getting those compounds so what is a way that people give mushrooms to their dogs you know you're not going to feed your dog a tea but at the same time they're not going to chew on a on a reishi conch well you could you could feed your dog a tea i mean you could pour it over their over their food and that would be one way to get it to but I think if you're using mushrooms for their medicinal properties, not for their edible properties, and many are edible, many aren't, as you say, quite woody, um, I think you have to do the, the standard hot water extraction for these mushrooms. You've got to break down that fibrous 
um, cell wall to release the goodies, you know, so they can have medicinal benefit. And so in that case, you know, it really depends on what the extraction process is and what the end result is. You know, it, most of them wind up with some sort of a, a powder, you know, a liquid that they wind up, you know, um, drying and, and powdering. And I think that powder can be very easily added to a pet's food. You can measure it with a kitchen uh, uh, teaspoon measurement in order to ensure that you're giving a dose relative to your dog's weight so it'll be effective. And, you know, and if you've got a picky dog and there are those out there, as there are picky cats, you can put it in capsules. You know, that's some, there are, um, you know, there's different, because getting the stuff into a pet can sometimes be the biggest challenge, you know, as compared to choosing what to give them. You know, I focus, I, I formulate a lot of products. And for me, the most important part of a product is, is it palatable? How do we get it into the dog? How are we going to ensure that this dog gets the goodies? You know, not every pet owner is really good at going, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and the dog starts to dislike that and you have to chase them around the house. Won't happen much after that. So looking at things like soft chews, which is a great edible treat that would have would have the, the mushroom extracts complexed in it, could even have other herbs and nutrients in it to, to enhance the activity of the mushrooms. I think soft chews are a very good um, way to go. I, I've been working on some scoopable powders um, using ingredients that tend to be more palatable, maybe staying away from the bitter reishi and looking more at the mushrooms that are tastier. You know, the shiitake, maitake, lion's mane, and cordyceps, you're still going to get a very powerful, you know, spread with those guys. So so that's that's what I, I look at as far as how we're going to give them to the critters. And I think that's really one of the most important questions and one of the most important answers, actually. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you because uh, dogs won't eat mushrooms just because they know it's good for them. Whereas, you know, humans might, uh, you know, whatever, plug their nose and eat something down. If it's a medicine, they know it's good for them. Uh, dogs, you got to be a little trickier in terms of uh, getting it into them. Um, you know, but on, on that note, do, do you recommend mushrooms can be part of kind of any dog's diet? Does that make sense for just kind of generally healthy dog to improve their health in, in, a, in a broad capacity? Or do you think it's better for treating specific conditions? And I guess to follow up on that, are there any reasons why dogs shouldn't use functional mushrooms? Good questions. Well, I consider mushrooms to be superfoods. And really, they are they are food. Even when they're woody, they're still, they, in fact, there's some uh, native peoples that will eat the, the woody mushrooms when they're young before they get too lignified, you know. I think that mushrooms have their highest calling when they're used on a daily basis. Um, this way, they train the immune system to be more um, vigilant, you know, all the time. And they work best when they're given on a daily basis. But I have a strategy, which is that, like, let's say we're going to use lion's mane as a sort of a settling or calming agent for an animal who may have a little bit of anxiety. Well, with anxiety in a pet, there, we find that if they, if they start getting anxious and they keep getting anxious, they, you, they experience something that we call wind up, which means that once they get really anxious, it takes a heck of a lot more to bring that down than if, if you start them early to settle down that anxiety before it gets out of hand. So in keeping with that, that's why I think a daily dose of mushrooms may be directed towards whatever the condition your dog wants, or maybe just for a general wellness type of approach is a good idea. And then if you have a point source of need, let's say, you know, you're taking your dog to the groomer, or, you know, it's 4th of July and you're going to be getting some fireworks. That's when you can load it on even more to kind of up that ante. But they're already in that position where they're not, where they're less likely to get wound up. And then the last part of your question, are there any mushrooms that I don't think a dog should get? Um, just the po I just think the poisonous ones, you know? Right. I guess to, uh, to follow up on that question, like, is there anything you've seen in your practice over the years where a dog has a, a bad reaction to mushrooms or, you know, like, you know, like some humans, right? It's uh, for most people, they're safe and effective and they, they work really well, but some people they just don't sit well with for some reason. Do you ever see that in dogs or is it a little more unusual absolutely. and how would you know? Yeah. You know, well, absolutely. I mean, every, every individual is an individual. And although we, we group responses in population, you know, in general responses, there's always those outliers. There's always those idiosyncratic reactions. And dogs are no different. 
and you know we'll see if see allergic reactions just as we see like for say with shiitake and humans um you know so there are there is that possibility so i don't discount it when i hear from a pet parent that a dog who has eaten a mushroom that's considered to be highly safe has a reaction i i rec i i you know i acknowledge it and i tell them let's stop and let's see what happens to that reaction and Maybe the reaction was caused by something else, since the dog can't really talk to you about what things it's been exposed to. And so if by stopping the mushroom, the reaction goes away, then that's pretty conclusive. And we'll maybe look for a different mushroom. I also recommend when you're starting a dog on something new, be it a mushroom, be it CBD, be it a new food, that you start slow and gradually introduce it to get the dog used to that. As a vet, the last thing I want is to send somebody home with something to give to their pet and it gives them diarrhea and ruins their carpet. <laughs> and then when you try to convince the pet parent to give it to them again, you know, start up with a lower dosage and start more slowly is to kind of look at you like you're crazy, like no way I'm going to do that dark. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Like dosage is important. I was actually going to ask you about that, but I guess a preamble to that story, you know, my dog Otis, we give them mushrooms as well and he really likes just like dried cordyceps and he'll eat them every once in a while but at one time i had like a bowl of cordyceps sitting on the table because i was filming something else and uh, he loves them so much he just jumped up and ate the whole bowl and i was like oh geez you know what's gonna happen what happened and he, well he did end up throwing up later that day but uh, you know it made, made a nice orange stain on the carpet he was obviously fine in the end he's he's got kind of a, a bit of yeah. an iron gut but i mean dogs do kind of sometimes have those reactions all the time right and i think if you know if if otis is having a little bit of cordyceps with his dog food every day that's probably super beneficial but maybe if he eats like a whole fistful of them at once you know that might upset him a little bit i mean dogs dogs will throw up every once in a while it just seems like a, a normal thing um, yeah, but... it's a defense mechanism. They're getting, they're getting this stuff out, you know. Um, plus, it's likely that Otis ate that whole bowl. It wasn't powdered cordyceps, was it? It was the cordyceps fruiting bodies. Right. So they're dry. They're a little bit abrasive to the lining of the stomach. So, in, so it may be that he wasn't so much reacting to the cordyceps as to the abrasiveness of the fruiting bodies in his stomach when he kind of got it all down, you know. Yeah, no, that that's a really good point. And then like to that note, like in, you said, you've been doing uh, practicing for 40 years, which is amazing. I'm sure you've seen a lot of uh, really amazing stories. I've heard some some pretty amazing anecdotal um, stories about people having success, you know, treating their dogs, various conditions with mushrooms. Is there anything that you've seen over the years that's been surprising that you can share with us or any story, obviously, without going into any specific details, but anything that you've seen over the years that's been really impressive in terms of how mushrooms are able to benefit dogs? Well, first, I'd like to say that we haven't really had very good mushroom products available, you know, in, in veterinary medicine. So I've been forced to um, to get the the whole dried mushrooms and convert them into some kind of a, a medication. So what I'd rather do is tell you the anecdote of my own dog, just as you shared Otis with us. I'd like to share the anecdote with Ollie, who um, I got as a rescue lab. Um, he was found as a stray with a broken leg and a dislocated hip at three and a half months of age. And we don't know what happened to him. Maybe he was hit by a car. Maybe he was kicked by a big person. You know, he's very scared of people. And labs at the same time are very needy. So it's kind of a yin-yang for him because he, he, he's very needy. He always wants to be near me, but he doesn't. he hasn't wanted me to get too close to him. Like if I go down and sit on his dog bed, I can be there about three to five minutes. Then he gets up and walks away. Okay. So I've been starting Ollie on lion's mane, you know, and I didn't see immediate results. I also was giving him CBD so I could see more immediate results with the CBD. And I think lion's mane, for those out there that are that use CBD as well, I think lion's mane and CBD is a perfect pairing. The two of them really synergistically work together very well. So, but now, three months later, Ollie is wagging his tail. I walk into the room, he wags his tail. Um, I was doing my floor exercises this morning. He comes over and lies next to me. It's like unheard of. So to me, you know, there's no real metric I could say, oh yeah, he's 20% better. But my observations of the dog that I've seen every day for the last 10 years, because he's 10 years old now, um, are that, yeah, yes. that And to me, that's a miracle. And that makes me really happy because I have a relationship 
with him again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, two notes on that. You mentioned lion's mane and CBD. Uh, I, I had a personal experience with that. That's just been absolutely amazing in terms of, um, you know, treating post-concussion s- symptoms and uh, lion's mane and CBD together. You're right. They seem to have this real synergistic effect. Um, but on the other note, uh, lion's mane, you know, I've had a conversation with someone who had a similar experience as you're talking about with their cat and they said they couldn't believe the difference that you know lion's mane made for for this cat so you know it, it is interesting that uh, not only is there a spectrum of mushrooms but also a spectrum of pets that these can be beneficial for but the other thing i wanted to dig into is i've also heard about functional mushrooms for horses is this something that is common or is this is this just crazy talk well, I- it's, it's a new thing as, you know, now that mushrooms are becoming more popular, I'm working in that space, um, looking, you know, we're working with dosing, we're working with applications, specific um, equine applications, equine uh, horses, for instance, can get these gastric ulcers. And the belief is that they're really neurogenic, they're stress induced. And so we're looking at using lion's mane to reduce the stress and because the benefit lion's mane has for the GI tract. But, you know, I think horses really could use it. Cordyceps, for instance, you know, horses are, you know, um, horses are all uh, lungs and legs. And mm-hmm. cordyceps finds its highest calling, not just with the kidneys as with cats, but also supports the lungs and also supports energy management. So to me, it seems like cordyceps would be an excellent, you know, supplement for a horse, especially a performance horse. And it doesn't test in terms of performance drug testing. So we're working in that direction as well. Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine the the dose for a horse and picturing it just getting a big scoop of cordyceps. Horses are extremely sensitive to things. And when you think about it, you know, the, a horse gets everything it needs just for foraging with the grass or, you know, a couple of handfuls of oats or grain. And so they've, they've learned their bodies are very good at extracting stuff. For instance, a horse, a thousand pound horse will take the same dosage that a 150 pound human will take and get the same blood levels, the same relative blood levels. Same with CBD. The dosages that we use in horses are really comparable to the doses we use in people and aren't that much higher. A person might take 30 to 60 milligrams twice a day for a significant condition of CBD, a horse might take 50 to 100 milligrams a day. And if it's got a painful condition like laminitis, it may take 250 milligrams a day. So that's, you know, we're not really talking CBD here, but we're seeing a lot more use of isolate in horses because isolate is a lot less expensive and isolate is zero THC. And I, the last I'd like to see is a thousand pound horse on THC. It would worry me. Around it. Yeah, yeah, you never know how they react. And that's really great to, to know about that nuance between dosage and how different species can react and how, you know, a lower dose can have a, a higher effect uh, on a horse that might weigh, you know, 15, 20 times more than a human. So in terms of dosage, is there any kind of strategy or anything that you've developed to try and determine what that appropriate dosage might be for a dog or for any kind of pet? The easiest way, I think, to dose a mushroom is especially with companies that will um, will um, analyze for their beta glucan content, standardize it. The company I'm with does that, and I'm I'm not sure about yours, but I bet it does. Take that because when you think about what the beta glucan content is in a mushroom, it would be relative to everything else that that mushroom's creating. It would be relative to the triterpenes, be relative to the phenols, relative to the cordyceps. So to me, it's like a marker a marker number that we have that's easy to derive and which is the same from ones within a given species. So I use the beta-glucan content and then I multiply that by the body weight of the animal. I like to use kilograms, but you can use pounds as well. And then I have three different tiers of application. If you're talking about wellness and very low, you know, just basically a daily superfood type of ingestion, that I have a very low dosage to use. If you're talking about moderate need, you know, where you might want to use the lion's mane for stress, where you might want to use the reishi for antihistaminic properties, something along those lines, then I would go ahead and use a moderate amount, which is about around twice the amount of the wellness. And the numbers are, if you want me to say them, two and a half migs per kig per day for the wellness level. 
about five mg to 10 mg per cake, somewhere in that zone. These aren't precise dosages. These aren't drugs. You can get pretty kind of cheap from the hip with them, but about five to 10 mg per cake per day for the moderate level. And then when you're dealing for the ultimate challenge, which is treating cancer, you go high, you go way high. You start at 10 mg per cake and you can go as high as 30 mg per cake. And mushrooms, as we've mentioned, edible mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms are very safe. The worst that might happen is maybe some diarrhea because the animal isn't used to getting that much right away, you know, build up to those higher dosages. But I've I've discussed, I've, I've found that I've, I've reversed engineered some studies that are out there and they fit into that. When I looked at cancer studies where they gave me the weight of the animal and the dosage and the studies failed, they used dosages that were lower. When they, when the studies were successful, they used high dosages within that, um, that level. So I think it's pretty good. I think it's, it's, it's a good way to kind of estimate how to get a dosage going that would address the condition and deal with the weight of your animal as well. That's awesome. And just so I, I'm, I'm clear on that, when you're saying, you know, a certain amount of milligrams per kilogram, are you talking about milligrams of beta-glucan or milligrams of just the yeah. milligrams no, of beta-glucan? Of... Okay. Okay. And of course, at the same time, you know, the, 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 the percentage of beta-glucan is consistent with the weight of the mushroom. So if you don't have that percentage of beta-glucan, you still could use that, understanding that um, that for many mushrooms, they, their beta-glucan content is generally around 25%. You know, I mean, we know that wild mushrooms, we can get anywhere from like 10 to, to 50%. But I think in general, what we see from the, the cultivated medicinal mushrooms, it's somewhere in that. So you could use that as a guesstimation. It's like I said, it's not a drug. We just want to make sure we're given enough for the condition that, that the animal has. Dr. Rob Silver, doctor of veterinary medicine and a formulator for uh, functional mushroom products for pets. Why don't you throw it off and, uh, you know, let us know where people could go learn more about you, learn more about your work and uh, anything else that you want to throw out there. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm chief veterinary officer for Real Mushrooms, which is a Canadian company that um, both cultivates and manufactures um, high quality, organically grown um, mushroom extracts. Um, but I also have my own website, and, and people are welcome to visit there. It's called Well Pet Dispensary, where I sell the real mushrooms, but as well, I also sell my own branded CBD products and other products that I have formulated and designed. I have a blog um, called um, NurseYourPet.com, and currently I'm working on um, developing my social media, developing my YouTube channel to do some educational videos of my own. I'm kind of a newcomer to social media, kind of a latecomer, trying to get trying to get um, get going with that as much as I can. Fantastic. And we will put the links to all of that in the description of this video or into the uh, description of this podcast if you're listening on Spotify. And uh, yeah, Real Mushrooms, we know those guys. We love those guys. We're a big fan of them as well. Um, so Dr. Yep. Rob Silver, thank you so much for joining us on The Mushroom Show today. Thank you, Tony, for having me. It's been, a, it's been a blast. That was Dr. Rob Silver. I hope you enjoy that. I certainly enjoyed chatting with him. One of the things I wanted to highlight here is just like mushrooms for humans, mushroom products for dogs can also have a pretty wide range of quality and of efficacy. It's probably even more so actually in the pet space. The mycelium on grain versus fruiting body debate is pretty important to highlight here because for example, a lot of people will look specifically for dog food that is grain free and it wouldn't be great if they were then inadvertently putting on a mushroom product that was mostly grain. So it's definitely something to look out for if this is something you're interested in. Of course, if you want to learn more about this, I have put all the relevant links in the description of this video, so go ahead and check that out. And that's it for this episode of The Mushroom Show. Again, thank you so much for being here. We're really building a cool community of people interested in mushrooms. So if you like mushrooms, if you like The Mushroom Show, go ahead and hit that like button. Again, it really helps to spread the spores and get the show out to more people. And hey, if you want to see future episodes of the show, make sure to hit that subscribe button as well. It really helps the channel grow. Finally, you might have noticed we put a lot of stuff from Twitter up here. I'm on there in between episodes of the show, interacting with the mushroom community, getting ideas from the show, and just kind of hanging out. So if you use Twitter, be sure to follow me there as well, at Tony. So thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next episode.